Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Kegebein with the Garland County Library in Hot Springs, and I have a very special guest author this evening, Janie Nesbitt Jones. And Ms. Jones is the author of the Arkansas Hitch in depth look chronicling the life of serial killer and Faulkner County native James Wayburn Red Hall, who, according to the book's description, confessed to murdering at least 24 people. Most of his victims were motorists who picked him up as he hitchhiked around the United States. In the closing months of World War II, he beat his wife to death and went on a killing spree across the state of Arkansas. His signature smile lured his victims to their doom, and even after his capture, he maintained a friendly manner, being described by one as a pleasant conversationalist. This book released earlier this year in the spring of 2021, and you can buy it from most of your favorite bookstores, or if you have a library card, join the hold list for it at the Garland County Library. And tonight we'll be hearing all about Red Hall the Serial Killer from the author of The Arkansas Hitchhike Killer, but first let me give a more thorough introduction to her, the author. Janie Nesbitt Jones began her literary career as a volunteer for the Humane Society of Faulkner County, writing copy for charity fundraisers. She and her schnauzer, Sylvie, helped introduce the Animal Assisted Therapy Program to Arkansas Children's Hospital. It was an article about Sylvie and other pet therapists that led to Janie's work in writing human interest features for the River Valley and Ozark edition of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. She and her husband, Wyatt, co-authored two books, Hiking Arkansas and Arkansas Curiosities. And in 2006, Janie found her niche as the true crime journalist for AY Magazine, Arkansas's premier lifestyle publication. It was as a contributing writer for AY that she discovered the story of serial killer James Wayburn Red Hall. So I talked to Miss Jones a bit the other day, and she gave me a sneak peek of what she had to say for this program, and she struck me as a pleasant and intelligent person who's put a lot of research and effort into studying this case. So I think you, the audience, will enjoy the program, and if you have any questions or comments whatsoever for the author, please don't hesitate to share those, and we will discuss them at the end of the program. So joining us from across the Arkansas River in Conway, welcome, Janie. Hello. Hello, Paul. Absolutely. And hello to all our viewers. So I'm going to let you pick over and give your talk, and when you're done, I'll return for questions. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I thought I would start out for the viewers who haven't read the book and tell you a little bit about the subject. Um, Paul covered uh, quite a bit of that. It is about a serial killer named Red Hall. Uh, his full name was James Wyburn, but everybody called him Red because of his red hair. Um, he was born in 1921 in a little community called Happy Valley, uh, which was close to a town, uh, the town of Enola in Faulkner County, Arkansas. And he had a very unhappy childhood, mostly because of his father, who was a preacher and a farmer, but a very strict disciplinarian uh, who was always on to Red about something or other, and he was abusive. He was physically, emotionally, and psychologically abusive toward Red. So it should come as no surprise that Red, as a little boy, would run off uh, at first, just run off into the other communities around there. And then he started going around the county and then around the state as he got older. And by the time he was 14, he was going out of Arkansas. In fact, he was in Kansas when he was 14 years old. Um, he was the son of Samuel Jerome Hall and Eva Lorraine Ingram Hall and was one of 10 children. Um, now his problem, his problem was that when he would go out on these trips, he was a rambler, he roamed. And at first it was um, hopping tri uh, freight trains. And then as the automobile became more, um, more and more uh, apparently uh, the, the mode of transportation, he really took to hitchhiking. He was good at it. Uh, he could make people uh, stop and pick him up. He would look so, oh, inviting maybe with his smile. 
Um, so he just played on people's kindnesses. Um, now he did marry. Um, he married, uh, well, he met his wife in 1938 and her name was Walsy McKee. But let me backtrack a little bit and tell you that he confessed that he committed his first murder in 1938 in Salina, Kansas. It was a woman. I could not find anything to verify that, find a name or anything because Red, he did not ever remember names. He lied a lot. He was a consummate liar. All he said was that they met on the street, basically. So it could have been anybody. It took place on North Santa Fe Avenue in Salina. So I'm hoping if anybody hears this from Salina, Kansas, they might be able to uh, come up with the victim's name. That was in 1938. Also in 1938, he killed 10 migrant farm workers um, down in Arizona. He was working down there. And with these people, to show you there was a difference, he, he didn't always uh, choose motorists. Um, in this case, in Arizona, he killed them by leading them off into the desert uh, one by one and then either hitting them or shooting them in the back of the head. Since they were migrant workers, there really wasn't any record um, of their comings and goings. In other words, nobody missed them, unfortunately. So he got away with that. So that was 11 murders that he committed, according to him, in one year. Now back home, um, he and Walsey, uh, struck up a friendship at first. Um, she lived next door to the Marcus Hill Baptist Church, and he was there. Uh, his father was a preacher, a Baptist preacher and a farmer. Um, so Red sometimes, although somebody said that he was never what you would call sitting in the front pew of the church, he did go to church some. So he met Walsey uh, at church. And she was a meek and mild young lady. She was unsophisticated, had never been anywhere in her life, a little country girl. And she was enthralled by his stories of all these faraway places. And he was such a conversationalist, he enjoyed talking. So they were a good pair. So they got married in 1939, but unfortunately for Walsey, and her mother who lived with them, Red did not stop rambling. He would just take off on a whim and wander around the country. He would go up, I think he had a favorite um, route, it seemed like, he would go through uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, then on out west, who got to California, then Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, back up into Arkansas, there was one report that uh, he even went up to New York State, which is kind of out, out of his hunting ground. So I don't think he did very well up there. Um, but anyway, um, as I said, um, Walsey's mother lived with them and the marriage didn't last. The, although Walsey was never happy with his taking off on a whim, because it left her and her mother in a lurch. They were farmers. Um, they had to get the crops in and everything like that. But she, like I said, she was meek and mild and she really didn't raise a stink about it. But she decided to separate from him. And then he was the one who asked for a divorce. Um, they had one child who lived. They had another baby who um, died at birth but they had one son who lived. And um, when they got divorced, uh, Red thought he was footloose and fancy free, but he was not because the Navy caught up with him. The Navy was conscripting able-bodied men to fill the ranks because like I said, this it started in, in 38. Now he started killing in 38 and went on through the war years. Um, 
let me get a drink because my mouth goes dry and my throat goes husky. Which could be romantic, but not in this case. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, uh, he was in the Navy, but he wasn't made for Navy life. They uh, put him out in California in the training camp. He lasted six weeks before they discharged him, supposedly for what they called indifference, whatever that was. He didn't know what it meant, but he figured it was the Navy's loss. So once again, he was footloose and fancy free until March 1944. He met a girl named Fayrene Clemens. She and her family were from Lone Oak, but she was living in Little Rock. And it was a whirlwind courtship. They got married. Um, pretty soon they realized it was a mistake. Um, she was nothing like Walsey. She was feisty and independent. She wanted to go with him on these trips out west. And he alluded to something that happened in Oregon one time when she went with him. Uh, he said at one point she knew too much, but that was never elaborated on. And uh, I couldn't find any record of the um, authorities from Oregon investigating this. So um, he was rough. He beat her up a lot. Now, see, he had never, he had never mistreated Walsey, but Fayreen, being Fayreen, she would aggravate him, and she beat, he beat her up a lot, um, uh, and her family was concerned. So, anyway, she did leave him for a little while in the summer of 44, but decided to go back to him eventually. This was her downfall. In September, um, they went to a place called the Rainbow Garden. It was a ballroom and they had uh, live music and acts, live acts and dancing. And she loved to dance. Well, that night um, they started sniping at each other and they really had a fight then after they got out of there. Um, there was a young lady, Katie Bryant, who was with them. Um, and they had to drop her off at her apartment. And she was the last one to see Faye alive. Ten days later, Faye's mother and sister went to the Little Rock Police Department and talked to O.N. Martin. He was the chief detective there. And he took down the information, um, gave it to his best detectives, uh, Herbert Peterson and Harold Judd, and they were a very good team. They were like good cop, bad cop. A good cop uh, would be Harold Judd. Uh, he looked more like, well, he was a gentleman, kind of dapper, um, soft-spoken. Uh, Herbert Peterson, he was a toughie. He's the kind you think of as being a tough detective. So they went to interview Red, where Red worked now. Red did work as a cab driver in Little Rock. He liked that job. He get, it gave him time to take off when he wanted to. And because he was such a good driver, the cab company would always take him back. And, and uh, even after he'd been gone for like three weeks, they would rehire him every time. Um, so anyway, Peterson and um, Judd kept tabs on him. Um, he told them that she, that, that Fayreen had just left him. And without any physical evidence or anything else to go on, they just sort of kept tabs on him, uh, but they couldn't arrest him. Now, after he killed Fayreen in September of 44, my theory is that that particular murder, for some reason, rattled him. He may even have loved her at some point. I don't know. But it caused him to go on a spree killing, a killing spree, I guess would be right the right way to say it. 
um, in Arkansas. See, he had usually done it outside the state. He'd never gotten any attention at all for any hitchhike related robberies or murders in Arkansas. But beginning in January of 45, he killed uh, Carl Hamilton, who was a barber and bootlegger in Camden. And then he killed um, Mr. E.C. Adams, who was, um, he was originally from Humboldt, uh, Humboldt, Kansas. He was on his way to a new job at the Camden Ordnance Plant. But unfortunately, he picked, he picked Red up. It was a really cold and drizzly day. And Red was out there shivering in the cold, you know, trying to thumb a ride. And of course, Mr. Mr. Adams, who was a very kind hearted man, picked him up. Unfortunately, he killed Mr. Adams. And um, actually, the state police were called in originally with the Hamilton killing in January because he had used a 45 caliber gun during that um, murder and robbery. So when, uh, whenever uh, the, a 45 was used, the authorities connected that to soldiers because there were soldiers all around at Camp Robinson. Camp Robinson was always busy. It had a fluid population of 50,000 people. It, uh, they trained soldiers there. It had a POW uh, place there and um, hospitals. So um, they, um, let's see, I've lost my train of thought, but, uh, Let's see. Um, well, I was going to say that um, during the, the, the war years, um, sometimes I think Red may have been picked up by people who really knew what was going on in the war. Uh, men especially would wonder, why in the world is this able-bodied man here and not not in the service but anyway um he he just went on this spree and oh i know what i was going to say uh, the 45 uh the 45 caliber gun was usually used by servicemen now to make that connection um you could call in the state police for help if you thought that um a serviceman was involved in the crime which is what they thought. So the state police came in to help them. And that was on the Hamilton shooting. And then when Mr. Adams was murdered, um, that started to create a chain of evidence. Uh, he shot Mr. Adams with a 32 caliber gun. I mean, 38 caliber, a 38 caliber gun. Um, and then he had another uh, victim Let's see, that was um, also in February, uh, Doyle Mulherin. He was a, a driver for a meat company. His, um, his route took him from Little Rock to Stuttgart. And people along that route knew him. And this is how the authorities first got their, the first clue about the hitchhike killer. Uh, people along Mr. Mulherin's truck route knew him by sight, and they could tell that that day there was a man in the truck cab with him, and it was a young man with wavy red hair. So it's not much of an, uh, a description, but it is something to go on. And then they also prove um, Alan Templeton was a ballistics expert. And he matched the 38 caliber uh, bullet that killed Mulherin to the one that killed Mr. Adams. And then his final victim was J.D. Newcomb Jr. Um, he, he actually put up a fight. He had a chance to put up a fight. Um, this was a little south of Conway. 
and um, somehow Mr. Uh, Newcomb sort of got the drop on Red and put up a fight because Red ended up killing him, shooting him in the face. Now, most of the time he shot them in the back of the head. So this was different. But um, Red was just unraveling at the time. I think he just started to unravel when he killed Bayreen. Uh, he was making mistakes. He was getting sloppy. And that's exactly what the state police thought. So you've got these two different uh, law enforcement agencies. You've got the Little Rock Police Department uh, keeping taps on, on, on um, Red uh, because they think that he killed his wife. Then you have the state police who are interested in these hitchhike killings. And they consisted of the, the main man in charge of the state police was J. Earl Scroggin. He was one of the original state troopers back when they were first called rangers. And he had two crack detectives on the case, Homer Sims and Rhett Oliphant. They backtracked on Mr. Adams's trip. They went all the way back to Humboldt, Kansas, and they came this way, um, came toward Arkansas, uh, trying to gather information from like the supervisors at motor lodges, tourist courts, um, things that were around back then where people stayed. Um, and they, they realized that when he got to Little Rock, that's where they knew that he had picked up the killer. So all of that together, they started piecing to things together. Um, and then Red made uh, he kind of made a big mistake. He beat up a guy. Uh, it was a brawl in a back alley behind a bar in Little Rock. But nobody should ever have fought Red. I mean, I've heard this from people who were like five years old. I have, since the book came out, heard from people who um, knew him even when they were five years old, and they remember him as being extremely strong. Uh, in fact, a lot of the um, material I've read about him called him Big Jim. That was not accurate because nobody I talked to called him Big Big Jim. He was always red. I think uh, Big Jim came from a co comic book that was written back in 1947. Um, but being a comic book, and it was supposedly about um, hall but being a comic book it's all fictionalized and just uh you know crash boom ba like they do in comic strips but there'd never been a book written about him so anyway um when the law enforcement people begin to realize that they are after the same person it happened with that brawl behind the bar uh, he beat up a guy so bad that uh, he was on the critical list for some time, and it, it, it was a long recuperative process for him. But when, when Red was hauled before the judge for that charge, he, he, he preyed on the sympathy of the judge. He told the judge that he was the son of a preacher, that he was a veteran, and all that. So he was let out on, uh, it was just court costs. It was like $106 and some odd cents was all he had to pay for that. But yeah, that kind of started making them uh, follow him more. And then Captain Scroggin with the state police got a tip. He got a telephone tip. And that was really what cracked the case open. And from then on, the Little Rock Police Department and the state police worked together. And they did that so well, which to me is a little unusual because sometimes law enforcement agencies are jealous about their jurisdiction. That's happened in some cases, like the Night, Night Stalker case out in California. 
there was a little rivalry going on between the Los Angeles police and the ones um, further north where the Night Stalker had been operating. Um, but these people were so good at their jobs. And another person who was good at his job was Joe Wurgis. Joe Wurgis was a newspaper man. He's my favorite person in the book. He had been working for the uh, Arkansas Gazette for 49 years before he retired. And in that time, he was the police beat reporter. He was so trusted by all the police, like the Little Rock State Police, sheriffs, everybody. They trusted him completely to the point that sometimes he wrote up the police reports himself. So Joe was considered one of them. So he had this exclusive access to Red Hall after he was captured. So much so that when they got together in a room and they were going to get a confession out of Red, you had the um, Scroggin, Sims, Oliphant from the state police. Then you had um, Peterson and Judd um, and Martin uh, from the Little Rock Police Department. And then there was Joe. Yeah. Joe got to hear the complete confession, and they credited Herbert Peterson with eliciting the confession by talking about um, Red's little boy. He did seem to have a soft spot for his little boy. Um, but anyway, I think I'll kind of leave it at that because um, I think I've really kind of covered all you really need to know, uh, except for remember that it was during the war. And one reason so many crimes that he committed were not attributed to him was because nobody was really paying attention to uh, people who were killing each other in this country. They were more concerned about the war and I mean, so many casualties every day. But the, the person who put Red Hall on the front page of the newspaper was Joe Wurgis. And, and when um, Red started leading them to the different crime scenes, her, uh, Joe was always there. Uh, and when they would ride in a car, it was always Joe on one side, Red in the center, and he was always handcuffed to Mr. Peterson, Detective Peterson. So Joe got in on all that, everything, uh, uh, the conversations they had. Um, and some of it is humorous. Um, I want to tell you that because it's not all so grim. And I think that humor is good in situations like this. It's it just keeps it from becoming unrelentingly um, grim. And Joe was a source of a lot of that humor, as was Red. So just some of the things that he would say, they were so ridiculous and they were funny. Um, now let me talk to you a little bit about how the book itself came to be. Um, how did this come to me? Well. I was working, and I still do, I contribute true crime, um, true crime articles to AY Magazine. AY is about you, and it's based in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, I was working for them back around 2011, and I was always looking for something new, something different that I hadn't really heard about before. So my friend Wanda McNinch, she kept saying, well, you need to write about Red Hall. And I'd say, who's Red Hall? There was nothing at all online when I started this. But she persisted. And I said, OK, tell me what you remember. She said, well, when I was about 10 years old, I know uh, he had been caught and he had killed a lot of people. And 
he was described as a, the boogeyman. She was 10 years old at the time. So um, I knew that that would put it in 1945. So I had the year. And then she introduced me to her cousin, Jackie Anthony, who told me that several old detective magazines from the 1940s and 50s had articles about red in them. So then I went to, now then I got online and I was looking actually for old detective magazines. And there happens to be a man named Patterson Smith who has a vast collection of true crime articles, magazine articles, newspaper articles, and books all about true crime. So I contacted him, but I thought, well, you know, what have I got to lose? And all I could tell him was it took place in Arkansas. He killed several people that had his name um, and the time frame and the movie magazines. So he went to work and he found five movie magazines that had featured stories about Red Hall. That was enough for me to do an article, a two-part article for AY. And um, that was kind of it for a while. About a year or two later, I decided to take a break from writing. Uh, that meant from writing articles. But I knew that I wanted to write a book about something. I was just ready for that. My husband, Wyatt, and I co-wrote um, Arkansas Curiosities and long before that, the hiking, um, hiking Arkansas. So Wyatt has always been influential. He's, he's, he's a good, uh, he's a big support for me and uh, he has great ideas. He also illustrated, he, that, that illustration that's on the front of the book was done by Wyatt, so I'm really proud of him. And he was the one who suggested me doing um, a book about Red Hall. And I thought, well, sure, Red Hall, that makes sense. So I thought, well, this ought to be interesting and not knowing what I was getting into. The first thing I did was I contacted all the people who were still alive who knew him back then. Um, one was Carnella, and they call her Connie. Um, she was a Hall, and she married uh, Mr. Weir, so she's Connie Weir. And she wrote a, a book called Happy Valley Memories. And I was fortunate enough to interview her, and she was a delight to, to listen to. She was wonderful. She was the one who talked a lot about uh, the bad influence that Red's father had on his life. She saw him beat Red severely. Um, so, and she called him El Diablo, uh, devil without horns. And then I talked to um, Walsy McKee's best friend. She asked me not to give her real name. So her name in the book is Della Fogarty. Well, Della knew um, uh, Walsy very well. They had gone to school together and they would have talks and, and, and Della would try to buck her up, you know, toughen up because people would make fun of Walsy because she was shy. She'd never been on a date or anything like that. People would tease her for that. And, and Della would say, you know, pay no attention to that. So I was fortunate enough to talk to Della. And she gave me the information about uh, Walsey and um, Red's married life, about the child and all that, the courtship and marriage, and then also about Red's funeral. Um, and that's interesting. Um, and then um, I just kept finding people to talk to. Unfortunately, most of them have passed on because I started this project um, in 2013, early 2013. 
And it spanned really the writing and the research spanned five years. And if you're if you know anything about researchers, you know that we like to keep going and going and going. But at some point you have to stop. So uh, it took about five years, but basically, and I still miss some things. I would like to um, invite you to look at my Facebook page um, about the book. It's called The Arkansas Hitchhike Killer on Facebook. And I'll try to add pictures as they come along. Um, some of the pictures I could not use because I, there, were, there was a lack of copyright. There was a copyright issue. But since the book came out, those pictures have popped up online. And I guess they just feel free um, to, to use those. And also, I want to invite you to keep up with me. I'm on Twitter, and it's um, Janie Jones, one, two, three, zero on Twitter. So remember that, and remember the Facebook page, the Arkansas Hitchhike Killer. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over, back, turn it back to Paul, um, or maybe some questions you have, or if Paul has some questions. I have quite a few questions, but you were so thorough with that you've already covered several of them so if some of these kind of overlap uh, for, forgive me on that but um, i'd love to hear you expand a little more on some of that um, and just a reminder for the audience if you have any questions or comments while i'm asking someone that one, uh, don't hesitate to share those all right so and, and thank you jane that that was a great uh, overview of your book and I want to talk a little bit more about your behind the scenes writing process and experiences. So okay. As a uh, mentioned in your introduction and, and that you touched on, you got into true crime in the mid 2000s when you joined AY Magazine. So what were you writing about before that? Uh, before that, I started out with that uh, weekend supplement uh, that you described, um, my little sh uh, dog, sh sh the sh schnauzer, a stutter. <laughs> the little schnauzer named Sylvie. Uh, Sylvie was very special. Um, so that got me started into the uh, human feature, uh, human interest, what do you call it? The human interest type features. <laughs> uh, and then, like I said, uh, along came that, it, it, this came out of nowhere. And a lot of my career has been built on coincidences, weird coincidences. If you're into psychic stuff, you might find that interesting. Um, along about that same time that I started writing for the newspaper, there was an ad in the state newspaper, uh, and it said authors wanted, it was Falcon Guide. They wrote uh, hiking guides, and they needed one for Arkansas. So Wyatt and I took that on. And then a few years later, we did the uh, Arkansas Curiosities. Um, and those, if you pick that up, it's kind of like uh, eating popcorn. It's the type of book that you can read a little bit of and put it down and then go back to it later. Um, so I have evolved. I, I would like to say one thing though, um, I sort of left out a little bit there, I think, about the research. Um, Joe, Joe Wurgis, like I said, there couldn't have been a book about Red Hall without Joe Wurgis. And I went to the library at uh, UCA's Torreson Library and went through all the microfilm uh, articles that I could find. And Joe was the most dependable. He was, like I said, I think it was because of his close connection with the law enforcement community that made it all possible. He was just there through the whole thing. Well, dog, so I can curiosity. Oh, yeah, I was, yeah, was going to tell you that, that, that another coincidence. Um, this is how I got to uh, writing for AY Magazine. <laughs> when our hiking guide came out, um, Wyatt and I were in Hastings Video and Books. They were still in business then. 
and we were looking for our, you know, going through the regional section, looking for our book, but I was uh, drawn to this little bitty book, and um, it's written by uh, Ray Hanley, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the other person's name. It's, it's a small uh, picture book, and it's about Highway 67, which was a main artery through Arkansas, especially back then. And uh, there was a picture of the Broadway Hotel in Prescott, Arkansas. Well, I used to live in Prescott when I was five and six years old, and it was like paradise for a child. It was maybe because the time of my life, but I just love that place. I still love that place. So that caught my attention, and I immediately I got in contact uh, with the people down there, and then I went down there and I talked to uh, the victim's um, son. A man had been murdered at the Broadway Hotel. He was the owner and manager, Chester Hooker, and this was back in the late nineties. Um, and his son, Jerry Hooker. He was so kind and helpful. He helped me a lot with that. So that was the first article I ever sent to AY. Um, and then this was a coincidence. They decided they wanted me to write another true crime article. And they had one in mind. It was about the murder of Mandy Tussing up in Northeast Arkansas. Um, that took place in 2000. The weird thing about that, it's truly weird. For some reason, I had clipped out an article about that very murder. This was long before I ever thought about writing true crime. And I stuck it in a folder. And I have no idea why. But it was just such a great coincidence. I mean, I felt like I already knew something about the case. And um, that was it. That's how I really got started with the true crime. So as you transitioned into darker subject matter, did you find yourself having to change your writing mentality, your style at all? I do sometimes. Um, I delib deliberately try to stay unbiased. I do when I'm going through some, uh, and nobody was ever charged, say, with the crime. Um, and I do have my opinion because I try to put as much in there as I can, not necessarily to lead the viewers, the readers, but I just try to stay objective and let them um, formulate their own theories. But yes, I do have opinions. So when, what is your, when you sit down to write, what is your day-to-day -day process like? Okay. First thing I do, the research, of course. I've got to get enough research. And sometimes, sometimes I can't come up with it fast enough like let me tell you this, because if anybody out there is interested in this case and hears it, um, there were two women who were killed up in um, Utah long about the same time that the Gabby Petito and uh, Brian Laundrie case was going on up there. But these two women were murdered viciously. A big mystery. One of them, uh, Crystal, Crystal Turner Beck. She was from Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I want to talk to someone about her, someone who knew her, friend, family member, anyone, because I'd like to tell her side of the story. Um, up in Utah, uh, the other uh, young lady, uh, Kylan Schult Schulte, she was from Moab, Utah. She was from there, so most of the focus has been on her. Uh, not a lot has been written about Crystal. So if anybody would like to contact me about that, 
um, please do so uh, via Twitter. Um, I would say Facebook, but I'm kind of hard to find on Facebook unless you're looking at the Arkansas Hitchhike Killer. In fact, you get to contact me that way, I guess. But um, it, it's when I have cases like that, I it's it's hard to approach relatives. You never know about their grieving process. Um, some are very open and welcoming, but I always sort of dread that first contact. I usually try to go through the investigators on the case first and then let them act as a liaison between me and the victim's families. Um, as far as the, it's just, um, I do the research and then I start formulating the the first part of it, the, the first paragraph is always important to me. You've got to grab the, the reader in that first paragraph. Sometimes that's not always easy. Um, but once I do, I feel I've got a foothold there. I've got something started. And then I start going through all the facts and everything like that. Uh, I want to say that in the book, The Arkansas Hitchhike Killer, I took things verbatim from Joe Wurgis, his newspaper articles, his in interviews with Red, they were verbatim, word for word. Um, like I said, the interviews with people who knew them and knew what happened, word for word. Um, and also, um, I guess, well, the, the trial transcript, when he was put on trial, uh, it's, it's the court transcript of his trial. That was immensely helpful because it gave a voice to people. And when I do this, I sort of, uh, you know, I don't really hear voices, but I sort of do. I get a feel for what they might sound like. I, I like to do that. And when I was reading the court transcript, especially with uh, Walsey, I just heard Walsey's voice. Um, Walsey to me was the most poignant um, character. And I say them, I call them characters, although I know it's not like a play or anything like that. I'm not trying to um, to say that in, by any means. Um, they were real, um, real victims and all. But uh, I just, uh, you get into it. When you get that foothold, and you may not know what it is at first. And if anybody wants to try this, if anybody's interested in trying to write a true crime, just start writing. Just start writing. Something will pop up. Start writing and then continue with the research. And there will be something in the research that triggers something in your mind. Um, I always like um, stories that have, as I told Paul earlier, uh, ambiance or atmosphere. And that's one reason why I am drawn toward older unsolved cases. Um, they're just sort of like hidden in mist, and that interests me. We talked about this before the program a little bit too, but do you catch yourself having to be have an extra sensitive tone towards victims and their families when you're writing? Yes, yes. I remember one time. Um, I was trying to get in touch with a victim's sister and I'm, I have made mistakes. I've made serious mistakes when it came to contacting people. Um, and know this, no matter how old it is, people still hurt. 
So I can't just assume that just because it's been 40 years, it still hurts. But luckily, most of the time, I will contact somebody. In this particular case, I talked to the sister of a victim, and I didn't know how to handle it because I got uh, her answering machine. And I didn't really know what to say, um, who I was. You know, I told her I, I wrote true crime articles. I was interested in her sister's murder. And I thought, oh my goodness, what if I have unnerved her? But she was really nice and she was helpful. Um, she even looked over what I had written um, to see if it was factual, and it was. So she was glad. A lot of people are glad. The ones who are glad are the ones who don't want their loved ones to be forgotten. And that's the main thing. Um, when I decided to write this book, I, I have been asked, why did you do it? Well, two reasons. One, purely selfish reason. Nobody had ever written a book about Red Hall, so I wanted to be the first. The other reason, though, is I wanted to contribute to true crime history. And true crime, as much as we might want to deny it, is part of our history. And I think it's important to have that written down. True crime is part of our history. It's important to remember that. So that was another reason I wrote the book. Well, I hope you were interacting with the victim sister helped get some closure there. I think it might have. I hope um, they never found, although they suspected um, there was a real suspect, but they couldn't. And that happens a lot. People will know. I, I mean, I have written several articles about people who were killed, murdered, and um, the murderer is really known, but uh, there's no evidence. So. Can you tell us about how the, the Red Hall case was brought to your attention by your colleague? You weren't familiar with it before, but what was it that really intrigued you about it when you heard about it? About Red, yeah, Red Hall. Writing pipeline. Um, because nobody knew about him. That was really it. The thing about Red was uh, he, he suffered a head injury when he was young. And I think that that had something to do with his going off the deep end and starting to, to murder people. The thing about him was he, he's not like a lot of serial killers. He's different to me. Most serial killers have some sort of, it may be sexual gratitude, something that really turns them on, that compels them to do this. Red, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that. He got no sexual gratification out of it. Um, he didn't get very much when he robbed these people. The most he ever got would be something like, Probably Doyle Mulherin was carrying the most, and that was like $126 or something like that. Um, he would steal mm -hmm. weird things, like from Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams, um, he was a heavy sleeper, so he took two clocks with him. One was a spring alarm clock. Uh, the other was an electric clock. Um, he, he was carrying a lot of... Uh, cigarette cartons. Back then, people smoked a lot. Um, and then, let's see, he had shaving equipment, things like that. And um, one thing that Red would do, he would look in the, on the body. He, he kind of had a habit of removing the shoes and, and checking to see if they had money in their shoes and things like that. But when yeah, he took Mr. Adams's clocks, he took his shaving equipment. He took um, everything else. The, um, some things he had to throw away, though. Uh, if it was engraved, he couldn't sell that. 
But people back then, and this is so hard to believe, Red would be walking down the street in um, Little Rock. He'd be carrying this clock. And a guy would approach him and say, hey, uh, is that clock for sale? And Red would say, sure. And he'd get a couple of dollars for it. I mean, it was crazy. He didn't, you can't really say that he did it for financial gain because he didn't get anything that was worth more than a few dollars. So he's just different. He's different to me. Um, I noticed a couple of criminologists when I went on uh, Twitter, when I was trying to build my Twitter presence, um, criminologists kind of got interested in that. Partly, I think, because they never heard of him. And then also comparing him to other serial killers, which is what I do in the book. At, uh, toward the end of the book, I do compare him to other um, serial killers and how they're alike and how they're different. Uh, even in 1940s money, two dollars isn't worth the temptation of, of no. going to that dream. No. His downfall uh, was it was a simple thing that he overlooked and he couldn't get over that he had overlooked it. He had a girlfriend at that time when he was like, um, let's see, that was, yeah, that was Mr. Adams. Um, he mailed a, a box of these things to a girlfriend and he kept that um, parcel post receipt. He forgot to get rid of it. And they found that that was a direct connection to him. So, but like I said, he was just going, he just devolved. Criminal Minds, most of you are familiar with Criminal Minds. And uh, I don't know if they invented that term devolving, but I love that term because it is so descriptive. Uh, serial killers will often, not all of them, but they will often get to a point where they start to unravel. That's called devolving. And that's when they start making mistakes. In fact, in the book, um, when um, Captain Scroggin and Homer Sims goes up to, I think you have a picture of this, um, to that crime scene where um, Red is standing in front of a burned out car uh, with Mr. Newcomb's body, where Mr. Newcomb's body was found. See there? And he's smiling. Look at that. He's smiling at the camera. Yeah. But uh, anyway, that's... Uh, uh, Since I showed that, we'll go What's through that? other photos that you sent me and you can tell us what we're looking at here. Okay. Oh, I love this one. This is all of the people in it. And like it says, left to right, uh, Rhett Oliphant. And uh, Rhett was the state police detective. Then Sergeant Peterson. And look, he's handcuffed there to Red. And then let's see which one's next. Um, yeah, Homer Sims. He was um, Rhett Oliphant's partner for the state police. And then, uh, let's see, Sergeant uh, 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 Harold Judd, he was Peterson's partner with the Little Rock Police Department. And then um, J. Earl Scroggin, he was the captain of the state police. And then Sheriff Gus Capel, um, he was, can't think of the county, uh, Lone Oak. He was uh, from uh, Fay Rain's hometown or that area anyway, Mr. Cable. And he was the one who told her to go to O.N. Martin at the Little Rock Police Department to report the missing, her missing. 
That is Fayreen. That um, picture I wanted to use, but um, that one was in one of the detective magazines. And I thought I could get permission from a Patterson Smith to use those, but he didn't feel right about that because he did not know who the original photographer was. Um, so I couldn't use it in the book because I had to notate every uh, uh, courtesy of the, the copyright, whoever had the copyright. So this is Fagreen. You get a bit better picture of what she looked like. Now you do don't you do, you don't see her teeth, and I won't give that away. I don't want to tell the whole story if you haven't read the book. But uh, she kind of had a buck, buck tooth, uh, and and Hall read. He said, "Yeah, that always hurt when they kissed." <laughs> I just kind of uh, interesting. Those are the guns. Okay. Uh, I think one's the 45 that he used uh, on Mr. Hamilton. Actually, um, that belonged to another cab driver. And that was an instrumental also in his downfall. Uh, one is the 38 that he used to kill, to kill um, everybody else. And then he had a little 32. And he thought that um, when they searched his apartment, they would not find those, but um, in fact, they didn't when they first, the first time they searched his apartment. And I love that part of the story because he was living, when he was uh, arrested, he had been living with a woman named uh, Ms. Rose. And I love the way um, the newspapers talked about her in the, her neat little house. But see, she had, she had gotten so comfortable with him staying with her in her, in his little apartment in her house that, um, she let him come into her part of the, uh, the house and listen to the radio with him and talk to him. And then when she found out that he was a multiple murderer, oh my goodness, she, you know, she shuddered to think at the thought. Okay, this is, uh, as I called it, Old Sparky. And one thing that I found out after the book went to print, unfortunately, was the song. And I almost lost my life <laughs> trying to get that song. I had been out to my friend Wanda's place because her friend kept saying there was a song written about Red. Well, I went out there and that was not fruitful. Coming back into town, I had a pretty bad wreck. But after the book went to press, I found out um, the book that the song is called Just 13 Steps. Now, like my husband, many of you might think 13 steps to the gallows. But no, he was 13 steps away from the electric chair. And the song Thir Just 13 Steps is available on YouTube. Uh, one recording is by Luke Gordon. That's an older recording. And then there's one by the Oak Ridge Boys. So it's thir just 13 steps is the name of that. You can find it on YouTube. So when Red Hot was execution, uh, when he was executed, he was only 25 years old and younger than that when the murders occurred. Did it yes. you when you learned how young he was in the first? Yes, that is what surprised me. I mean, you lose fact, you, you lose track of that. Um, he was born in 21. Uh, and actually, when he was um, executed, he was still just 24 because of the way his uh, birth date fell in the year. He would have been 25 if he had lived a few more weeks. Uh, so he was 24 years old when he was executed. Um, I mean, what did I, 24, 24 years old, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that is hard to remember because think about it. He started killing when he was um, 17, 1938. He was 17 and he killed all those people. And there were a lot of other uh, murders in other states that fit his MO 
And when he was arrested, um, the police department down in Little Rock were kept very busy um, sending out the, his fingerprints and everything like that. Um, there were unsolved murders in Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, like I said, all over the place. Uh, Seminole, Oklahoma, there was a police chief there named Jake Sims, and he was a really good police chief, and he caught a lot of murderers. In fact, about 50, I think, that's in the book, but Red Hall was never one of them, but he was, he was pretty sure. It was, he knew Red because Red had been there several times. And that particular murder that took place in Seminole was another one that was not, it wasn't picked up by uh, the victim. Um, Red, it was near the railroad track, so I think Red had hopped a freight. And for some reason, he got off there and the man was parked right there close to the tracks. And uh, he had just been a little two bit poker. Um, game didn't have a lot, you know, but uh, um, Red bashed his head in, but he didn't leave fingerprints because the, the weapon was grooved, um, had grooves in it, so they couldn't take fingerprints. With so many murders that Red's accused of in a short period of time, do you think there's any that he took credit for just for the attention? I don't think so. Uh, although he did, he was a narcissist and he loved attention and he did lie a lot, but there are certain things that just add up in some way. Um, he said that he had killed a man um, just that last, let's say December of 44. And I believe that was one in San Marcos Texas, and they contacted the officials down there. They said they did, had, did not have anybody reported murdered or missing. But during one trip, um, he had he came back to Little Rock in a maroon car, and the back seat was filled with Bibles. And somebody noticed that and they remarked about it. And he said, oh yeah, I worked for a, a Bible company selling Bibles for a while. And I thought, mm -hmm. no, that's not your car. And you probably killed a Bible salesman is frankly what I suspect. So do you think it was the era that it was in and the, and the distraction of the war, were those the main factors in him getting away with so many murders or was there something else about him? Well, it was his personality partly because he was charming. Um, and if he wasn't having one of his moods, um, Della Fogarty said that he was like a, a, a two, there were two sides to him. Uh, he would be, funny and, and friendly. And then like a flipping a switch, he would really explode into this anger, uh, this angry stage. Um, so um, I just, uh, does that, I was trying to remember what exactly. Um, yeah, just that the <laughs> factors that led to him getting away with so many. Yeah. Oh, okay. Time, yeah. Period of time. Yeah. It was partly because of his personality and then mainly because of the war, mainly because of the war. Um, because even in 1938, people were getting uh, worried. And then also in 1938, they were still recovering from the, um, from the depression. But then in the 19, in, from 1940 to 45, you know, especially 41 to 45, everybody was uh, concerned about the war. And I, I include that in the book. I try to weave it in with his story because it's kind of funny the way people's lives do interact, the way you meet people. 
Um, and he would brag to the right people about, he claimed he was at Guadalcanal and Midway. Yeah. Never happened. And so that's why I wonder sometimes if, if he raised that in the conversation with whoever picked him up, um, did they say, why aren't you, why aren't you still in, what happened? You look fine and fit to me. And I think that may have set off some, because, because it was men who would pick him up. Women didn't do that back then, you know? So it was always men and they, they, you know, they would, particularly interested in the war, not that women weren't. I mean, they were, of course, worried about everybody. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think the war stole his thunder, you might say. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, uh, a minute ago, William in the uh, YouTube comments says, El Diablo selling Bibles, very sardonic. Yes, yes. There's a lot of irony in there. <laughs> so you mentioned this earlier, there's some comparisons you make in the book to Red Hall and other serial killers uh, that remind you of him. Um, would you like to share one of those? And, and do you think there's any that were inspired by him? I, I doubt that the, any were inspired by him because like I said, he was not well known. Uh, but I do compare him to others. Um, he, he shares some of the um, traits of other serial killers. Um, a lot of them have head injuries. And, uh, and Red's head injury was significant enough to cause, I think, um, uh, uh, problems with his motor skills because Jackie Anthony, who did know him pretty well, always said that uh, Red sort of ran with his um, left leg first. So I think there's a proof there that there's some sort of neurological problem. Um, so serial killers have that in common, um, head injuries, um, a lot of them. Um, and well, one that comes to mind, uh, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Uh, but there are a lot who share that. They also, come from um, homes that were abusive. Um, they start out with, uh, and Red did this. Um, I don't go into that because that's just, it's just, I don't like writing about torturing animals and things like that. Um, but they have that in common. Uh, serial killers, will. Uh, a lot of them will do that. Um, but as far as comparing him to another serial killer, I honestly can't. I know that there are a lot of serial killers connected to the highways now. Um, like there's the uh, Santa Rosa hitchhike killer, um, the I-95 hitchhike killer. There's even one, the I-40 hitchhike killer. Um, there's just so many of them. Um, I think they say that in any, I believe the FBI says that at any, any given time, there are about 50 active serial killers in the United States. And I read one um, uh, statistic said that, uh, said if you pass a thousand people on the street, one of them will be a serial killer. And uh, on, on <laughs> it is since chills up and down your spine. So question from Karen, why has he been forgotten or not written about before you? I'm sorry. I didn't get that. Uh, why, why has red been forgotten or not written about before you? Um, it's a question from Karen. What has not been, but why, was about? Red, why was the red hall case uh, not written about until you? I'm sorry, kind of cutting, cutting right. out a little bit. Why was this case not written about un until your book? Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, 
I think, okay, for one reason, um, his trial um, was uh, undergo. Uh, it was underway when uh, the war in Europe ended. So everybody was out in the street uh, celebrating and not paying any attention to what was going on in that courtroom. Um, so between that and he was convicted and he was sentenced to death. Um, and then uh, in October, um, I believe it was, the state Supreme Court reaffirmed, they affirmed his death sentence. And see, at that time, it, was, it hadn't been long since the war in the Pacific had ended. So again, the war stole his thunder. Uh, nobody was really paying any attention, except like I said, like Joe, Joe Orges. Yeah. So, um, just a few more questions for you, but before we move on to those, any last things about Red Bull that stood out to you? Um, the fact that he blended in so well with everybody, that is, everybody who didn't know him well, when it came out about what he was, um, people from Enola, people from up in that area, they weren't surprised. Um, they said that he was mean all the time. Um, so he, he just, he didn't have them fooled, but when he would get out and go somewhere, he would turn on the charm. So, you know, if you were meeting him just for the first time and just casually, you'd think he just, Hey, that's a pretty nice guy, friendly. <laughs> so yeah, it's just um, just the way he fit in with strangers. So the fascination with true crime has become more popular than ever in recent years. And there's no shortage of books and documentaries and podcasts and blogs. So I want to get your take on that obsession from someone who writes about it. Is, is it a healthy hobby or has it gone too far or somewhere in the middle? Oh, maybe somewhere in the middle. Uh, I, I know the market is saturated at this point, but it is healthy. Um, don't be worried if, if you like to read true crime and, and get some sort of thrill out of it, because for one thing, it's cathartic. And um, I say this because women who read true crime, and they do it for a different reason from men. Men who uh, read true crime, they like the ones about spies and guns and action and all that stuff. Women, and women make up about 75% of the true crime readers and fans. Um, they like the psychology, which that's what I like. I'm interested in the psychology behind it. Um, and so don't worry about that. It can be cathartic in that women may learn something. You actually may learn something. I've, I've read of people learning uh, something from a true crime book or a TV show or something like that. And it has really helped save their lives. So don't worry about that, you know. <laughs> okay, my favorite TV show of all time, and he's back, Dexter. <laughs> Not a bad that's, that's a good example you know um we all love dexter but he's a serial killer oh my goodness but he does <laughs> because those of us who love dexter know that he just kills bad people and in a way that's cathartic you think mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> if i could have done that and a lot of people you know Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who might take that a little too seriously and uh, take it into their own hands. Don't do that. <laughs> but don't worry. It, it's, I think it is a, a healthy pastime and it's informative. It's entertaining, actually. Um, I know it's not for the victim's families, but back when they did those old uh, detective magazines, those were extremely popular. So it's been around for a long time, but yes, 
it, it, the market is really beginning to be saturated, uh, podcasts and everything. And I'm partly to blame for that. So. <laughs> well, I'm sure you appreciate it at least. <laughs> Yeah, I need to check out the new episodes of Dexter. Uh, it's, it's on Showtime, Amazon? Showtime. And I, I subscribe to Showtime just for Dexter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so what are some of your other favorites on that note? Uh, shows, other fellow writers, uh, any, anyone you'd recommend? Oh, uh, well, my favorite writer of all time, Truman Capote in Cold Blood. That's my favorite. Um, favorite true crime book because of the way he wrote it. You know, it was a big thing at the time he was credited with writing the first um, nonfiction novel type. Uh, it's written as a novel, but it is based on a true crime. Um, now he and, and um, oh goodness, my, my memory fails me. Um, some other uh, writers, a lot of times they were jealous of each other. Um, oh, goodness. Do you remember the um, Norman Mailer? Oh. Norman, Norman Mailer. Uh, he was always critical of Capote. And then what did he do? He turned around and wrote uh, the Executioner song about Gary Gilmore. And he won the Pulitzer. Capote did not. <laughs> I didn't like that very much. But anyway, yeah, Truman Capote. Um, and I like Amlin Williams. He wrote a book. Oh, um, goodness. What's the title? It was about the Moors murders uh, in England. Myra Henley and Ian Brady, who made a killing team. Uh, they killed children out on the moors and took their bodies out there on the moors and there's an excellent movie about them uh i think it's on netflix so just look up um the moors murders something like that um i believe it was netflix and that is really a good movie and it's based on a very good book emlyn williams um can't remember the title. Well, going back to you could go working at a library that turns about right to 75% uh, women being the true crime fan, looking at our hold list. <laughs> Maybe more than that, at least for our library. <laughs> uh, so, so when your book finally released earlier this year, what was the reception like? Well, um, it's been slow. The pandemic has affected everybody. I hear that all over the place, even from well-known writers. They're having problems too because um, not being able to get out there face-to-face um, -face with the readers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, book signings that have had to be canceled. Um, so that has hurt. But I'm hoping that things like this, it's its a very good way to communicate with people. Uh, since we are, some of us are still worried about that. I naturally, you know, with the Omicron and all that, uh, starting all over again. Um, but that has been a hindrance. Uh, I'm hoping things will pick up. Uh, I hope to make more contacts across the country in different states. Um, I think that people, especially ones mentioned uh, like Kansas and Oklahoma, uh, there was there was a series of killings in Miami, Oklahoma, and I'm not even sure they, seems kind of like they pronounce that Miami, but anyway, uh, I call it Miami, Oklahoma. Uh, there was a series of killings there and the authorities suspected red and i go through all the ones there were some that he looked really good for and the authorities did think that he committed those crimes but that's where he started to clam up uh, 
that he got to a point where he wasn't talking anymore. Um, although it was on one, one of the trips to a crime scene when uh, he was talking to um, Joe Orgis and Herbert Peterson, and he said um, there were a lot more or something like that. <laughs> and uh, Peterson said, more? How many are we talking about? And uh, Red said, closer to 24 than 12. Well, if you add it up, you've got 17 already. Um, the five people here, um, let's see, 11 there, 16, 17, counting his second wife, that's 17. And then if you start including um, a case about uh, Dr. Merrill Lambert. He was an osteopath. Um, this was in Oklahoma. And uh, he picked up a soldier who was on his way back to the base camp. Uh, so he, Dr. Lambert gave the soldier a ride and then they gave Red a ride, we think. Yeah, this is a very strong possibility here. Um, so if it was Red, and it sounds like it was, he shot both of them to death and then, of course, took the car. He's a strong suspect in that case. Um, I did have the chance to talk to a, a cousin of uh, Corp the soldier was Corporal Nipper, uh, Corporal Charles Nipper III. And I found out that his case was never solved. So um, I tried to track down all of them to make sure they were never solved. I thought, well, if I put something in here, I, I worried about that, um, putting something in there that was solved at a later date. But I went as far as I could. I tried contacting um, some relatives of victims. Uh, they, for re different reasons, uh, I, I was never able to make contact. Um, but yeah, he was a good suspect. Police Chief um, Jake Sims in Seminole, Oklahoma. Uh, he was pretty sure that uh, Red had committed the murder there. So I do, I do list those. I do, I list all the possibilities. There's one that I, does not sound like him at all. So I just put a little asterisk by his name. Well, it sounds like there's no confirmed information out there. There's room for a sequel or at least a new edition. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, so speaking of that, what's next for you and what's doing in your brain for the future? Well, I was talking to Wyatt about that. Um, I'm getting a lot older now. Memory's not as, as keen as you can tell because I lose my train of thought. Um, actually, I would uh, sometime next year, perhaps, um, maybe around my birthday, um, turn my attention to things other than true crime. Um, I do have a couple of ideas and um, I like to try if any of the viewers are, in, are interested in psychic phenomena, um, you might look for me on uh, Twitter uh, because I would like to, a lot of weird interesting things have happened to me in my life um and i thought about sort of uh, a memoir uh combined with uh, psychic stuff <laughs> and i'd love to work on that and then of course there's the there's the great american novel which is in the bottom of the file cabinet <laughs> i finished it many many years ago so i would have to update that and find a home for it so from pets to hiking to mothers to psychic phenomena, what, what a journey. Oh, I have lots of interests. I can just go on and on. <laughs> I like architecture. <laughs> I like a lot of things, yeah. 
Well, Janie Nesbitt Jones, this has been a wonderful discussion and presentation. So I'm going to give you an opportunity, uh, let all of the viewers, current and future, uh, remind them where they can find you and check out your book. Okay. Um, yes, you can find me uh, on Twitter. It's uh, Janie, J A N I E J O N E S, one, two, three, zero. Um, the Facebook page for the uh, Hitchhike Killer, it's it's Facebook and it's uh, the Arkansas Hitchhike Killer. Um, now, as far as finding the book, um, it is in brick and mortar stores like uh, Barnes and Noble um, and the little independent um, bookstores. Um, also, you can um, check out Arcadia Publishing. Arcadia, uh, they will do the, uh, they have two, uh, an imprint of Arcadia Publishing is the History Press and the Hitchhike Killer is officially under that. Uh, but if you go to Arcadia Publishing, Google, Google, uh, Arcadia Publishing plus Jamie Jones plus the Arkansas Hitchhike Killer and you'll find it. You'll, you'll find the, uh, the uh, publishing company. So, and of course, uh, it's available online. Amazon is one of them. Lots of different places online where you can order it. Well, uh, oh, yeah. Knock on wood, oh, allowing you have an upcoming in person event with our neighboring library over in Saline County. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes, we're going to do the same sort of thing here. That, that we've done tonight. And also I will be able to do a, a book signing. I, I think things must be opening up a little bit because I did, I was contacted recently uh, by someone uh, at the Lehman Library in Little Rock and I need to get back to those, to, to them and um, hopefully some more, some stores down in Little Rock. Um, I would like my husband, uh, he, recently retired so we would like to just kind of take off and travel a little bit and i in particularly uh, I, I particularly love the west so um going through oklahoma uh up to kansas i'd love to go to selena kansas so anyway that's what i would like to do really in the not too distant future. Um, I'm hoping that we get things under control as far as the, um, the virus and all that um, to the point where we can travel and be open with each other again. I know it's very depressing um, for a lot of people, in particular, they say for young people, uh, it's just a very depressing time and we need to get out and so if you do have a chance and i would say you know by all means if you don't feel uh comfortable um going to something like that i understand um but hopefully um precautions will be taken so that we can do it that's one of the best there's a lot of things you can do outdoors safely and away from the crowds right and i'm sure in the back of your head you'll be taking notes of things to write about too even if it's a vacation yes <laughs> um, yes I, I kept putting my facebook friends all up to date on our late our last trek out west <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Janie Jones, it's been a pleasure, great discussion, and great sitting down with you. And to all of our viewers, uh, appreciate you watching, and please be sure to share this. And this video is available to watch indefinitely on the Garland County Library's Facebook channel and YouTube page. Um, and if you tuned in late, uh, it should be available immediately for you to go back and watch the beginning if you missed any. So, um, any final words for you, Um, I just hope that the viewers enjoy the book and uh, get something out of it. Uh, like I say, I, I hope it's a combination of uh, being in, informative and entertaining. What's for me? Thank you. All right. Well, take care, everyone. Uh, have a happy, safe holiday weekend, and until next time.
Bye-bye.